Hello, my name is Jonathan Burnside and I'm going to introduce neural networks today. Um, this is just an introduction. The topic of neural networks is very deep and can become very complex. A lot of options available to you. Um, this presentation should just, just be used as an introduction and get a rough idea of how, how we can use these things. It's probably enough to, to let you use a third party tool um, like Microsoft's Cognitive Network Toolkit or uh, Google's TensorFlow um, or, or some other third-party neural network tool. But this presentation is not going to give you enough to build one from scratch for yourself. It, it should just an introduction and get you, get you started and see if this is something you need to know about or want to know about more. Now, neural networks are, are based off of what we believe the brain, how the brain works, the neurons in our brain in a, in a network here. Now, I am no neurobiologist, so uh, we're going to make some comparisons to, to your actual physio physiological anatomy of the brain, but uh, this is a huge oversimplification of what's going on there because, well, I'm no expert on what's going on there. You probably aren't either, but that's okay. <clears throat> so. Our brain is made up of neurons, um, and they are networked together, and we have a ton of them. We have some rough numbers in the next slide we'll show you. But uh, for our concerns, the important parts of a neuron are the axon. This is sort of the output. Um, in a bit, we'll write kind of a function that def defines what, what a neuron does. Um, we can think of the axon as being the return, the, the result of that function. The dendrites, those are the inputs. That's where we get information into the neuron. Um, they, they pick up signals from, from things. So going back to sort of the, the function example, these, the dendrites would be our, our input, our parameters, our arguments. And last we have the synapses. Um, for each dendrite, there is a synapse. And this controls uh, how much signal flow we get across that dendrite. This is uh, this is what, we, what controls how much we care about that dendrite, how much we care about that parameter. So in our brain, the synapses are, are what learn or how, they, how we control learning, um, how much of that flow is allowed, of signal flow is allowed to go through, um, con controls what ultimately the neuron does. Um, and we, then that, that flow will increase or decrease. The most often used uh, synapses and dendrites, you know, where, where we, we have signal going across them the most often, uh, those synapses will be reinforced. They'll, they'll let more, more energy, more flow, more signal flow across them. Um, when dendrites and synapses go unused, uh, the synapse reduces. It, it lowers the amount of signal that can go across. So basically, every time a signal goes across, uh, it reinforces itself. And over time, when it does not have signal going across, it negatively reinforces itself. So um, kind of every time we have an idea, that's immediately reinforced. But if it turns out to be a bad idea and we don't do it again, it'll be negatively reinforced over time. And that's, like I said, a huge oversimplification of, of how uh, neurons in our brains work and, and ultimately how we learn. Um, but that's, that's kind of the rough model we're going to use for our artificial neural networks. So just a, a few more uh, rough uh, information about our brains. Um, our brains have around 85 billion individual neurons and is a very heavily interconnected network. Each of those neurons have about 7,000 synapses, so, so 7,000 connections to other things. Um, those, uh, those connections are most typically other neurons. So, so the axon from one neuron um, is connected to the, the dendrites of another um, via a synapse to control that flow. Um, but 7,000 connections per neuron. Uh, the signal rate of our brains is around 10 milliseconds transmission speed. Um, that's, that's slower than a typical CPU, uh, but our brains do things in parallel, so, so we can kind of overcome that, that uh, lower speed than our CPUs. Um, we draw around 20 watts of power, which is very little. Um, and 
This, this last bit's uh, a little out of date, but one of the largest uh, artificial neural networks, um, at least back in 2013, was created at Stanford, and it had about 20 million neurons with 11 billion total synapses across those 20 million neurons. Uh, this is about four orders of magnitude short of the human brain. Now, like I said, though, this, is, this uh, is probably out of date at this point, and it's kind of a moving target. You already get an idea of how much uh, smaller any uh, artificial neural network is compared to our brain at this point. So we're going to actually kind of create a model that uh, of the same sort of system, an artificial neural network. Um, we're going to connect. Uh, we're going to make a bunch of neurons and connect them together. Now, a neural network can be used for sort of general purpose problem solving. In, in theory, we could use a neural network to solve kind of any problem. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the best solution to those problems, but, but uh, it, it does, that is pretty powerful, that idea that we can use it for almost any, any problem. Now, when we're setting up our neural network, we're going to do it in multiple layers. Uh, in the uh, graph um, on this slide, you should be able to see the input layer, layer 0, layer 1, and the output. Our input layer is, is just the input information into our network. Um, whatever information our network needs in order to make a decision. Um, the output layer is the decision that was made. This is the output of our, our full neural network and hopefully it's making correct decisions. Uh, layer 0, layer 1, and, and conceivably more layers, these, these are where our actual neurons live. Um, they're often called hidden layers. But we could have any number of layers of neurons we want with any number of neurons in each layer, theoretically. Uh, the, the rule of thumb, though, generally is you know, less is more. We want to we can we can solve uh, theoretically most problems in, in just one layer with very few neurons. Though, um, we, when we get into topics like uh, deep learning, um, what they really what that all that really means is that we have multiple layers of neurons, um, and that's really good for things like pattern detection, where we need to abstract our data. Um, in, in kind of interesting ways. But for most problems, we can get away with a much smaller network with only uh, one or two layers with a few neurons in each, such as the picture. Now, one of the most interesting things with the neural network is that all the neurons do the same thing. Um, ultimately, they, they might, the, what, what they tell us will change, but the function of what they do is, is identical. If we, you know, when we represent this mathematically, one neuron to another is doing exactly the same thing. They're just taking in all these inputs, um, as represented by our dendrites and our real neurons, and for each input, we're weighting that value. So input 0 gets multiplied by weight 0. Input 1 gets multiplied by weight 1. The weights in this case are, are functioning as our synapses. They're controlling the signal strength of a given input. Now we, now we do this weighted combination. So we each input times each weight, and then we add all of those together. Um, and we could kind of think of what we do next as comparing that result, this, this weighted sum, to some threshold value. If it's greater than our threshold, we, we activate the neuron. Basically, we return true. Otherwise, we return false. We're going to change this a little bit. We don't want just a true or false output. Instead, we're going to want a, a, a continuous value, a, a 0 to 1 as our output. And usually, our weights can be a negative 1 to positive 1. Um, but we, again, we can set up our networks in a variety of ways. But uh, ultimately, we won't, want our, we won't want our output to just be true or false. Instead, we'll, we'll want it to be sort of a probability of whether or not this is a true or false. So it won't be just 0 or 1, it'll be somewhere between 0 and 1. So we're going to go in a little deeper into that process of how a given neuron works. And we're going to do some pseudocode here just to help us understand. Now, I do want to mention, again, this is not exactly how we would want to set this up. This would, this would you know, conceivably work, what we're going to do. But um, there are definitely ways to make this much more optimized in code. But for a given neuron, we're going to do three basic steps. Um, and, and these are going to change a little bit as we go. But step one, we kind of already talked about. That's that uh, weighted product, so a, or dot product, or sum product. You might have heard of these, these terms. It just means we're going to take each input times each weight, 
uh, excuse me, each, each unique input times its weight, add all of those uh, together, that's step one. Um, step two, as I mentioned, we're going to kind of change this, but for now we can think of it as just being, we're taking the value from step one and comparing it to some threshold. Is it, is it greater than or less than? Um, and this, will, this ultimately will create what we call an activation value. And finally, step three will be to filter that activation value. Um, remember, we wanted to make sure our, our output was 0 to 1. Um, we'll, once we change some things in step 2, we won't be able to guarantee that, that sort of 0 to 1 relationship anymore, but then we'll add a filter step to make sure it's 0 to 1. So first things first, that's some product. So we're just, as, as mentioned, we're just taking each input times its given weight, adding all of those together. Then step two, we can think of as this. We're comparing our net input um, to some threshold value. Uh, as I said, though, this creates a binary uh, activation. We're going to want to change that a little bit. So thinking about that activation value, where we now have it uh, net inputs greater than or equal to threshold weight, we're going to start moving things around a little bit. So we could add a times one to the right-hand side of this uh, this comparison, net input is greater than or equal to one times threshold weight. Doesn't change anything at this point, um, but we'll, we'll, it'll help us in a few steps. Um, next though, we're going to subtract from both sides that one times threshold weight. So now we have net input minus one times threshold weight is greater than or equal to zero. And this is just a little magic. We're going to rename that threshold weight value bias. Um, and that's just a common vocab for this. Um, it, it's still representative of the same uh, concept, sort of a threshold of, of where we want our true and false uh, points to be. Um, again, it's not going to be exactly true or false anymore in a second, but that's, that's just a vocab thing for the most part. So now uh, float activation just equals net input minus one times bias. So, so at this point, we, we aren't getting a binary value anymore. We we're actually going to get kind of a fuzzy, we could think of it as a fuzzy activation, but it really is going to be continuous. It's not even guaranteed to be between 0 and 1. Um, we could have a range, values far outside of that range at this point. But why did I even put that 1 in? Why don't I just do net input minus bias? it would get the same answer. Um, I'm only putting the one in to show this idea. Remember we got net input by taking each input times its weight, adding all of those together. We could actually include this bias portion into that equation. Um, the bias is just another weight and its input is always one or negative one in this case, excuse me. So now we could just do float activation equals input times weight plus input times weight plus input times weight um, and that bias being one of our weights with just a constant input of negative one. So here we've updated our uh, process neuron method um, to include the bias which is now not just a binary thing we're actually going to get a continuous value out of this. So now we need our third step where we we filter this activation value to make it 0 to 1. Um, and there's a lot of different activation functions or filter functions we could use here. Um, one of the most common and uh, functions is, is the sigmoid function. So we'll use that one to start. So as I mentioned, we want to filter this uh, output. We kind of want two things from our filtering. We want to make sure our output is mapped um, to 0 to 1 range. And we also typically, we, we want to use this for classification, not, not just a continuous value, meaning we're, it's really trying to decide something like, is, is this true or false, or, or is this a picture of a cat, dog, or flower? Um, that's a discrete uh, output, and when we want that, that's called a classification. Um, the sigmoid function is going to give us better results for this, um, because it's actually going to take our activation value and output a 0 to 1 range, but most of that, most for most activation values, we will get something very close to 0 or very close to 1. 
um, on this on this slide we've mapped or we've graphed out the sigmoid function um, see uh, the the uh, horizontal axis is our activation value and regardless of what number we give there we're always going to get something between 0 and 1 we kind of get this sort of s-shaped uh, graph out of it where most of the values are either 0 very close to 0 or 1 so this is we can use this as kind of a probability of, uh, of that answer is it, is it very likely true or is it very likely false or, or sometimes we're unsure in that sort of middle range Okay, so that, that's kind of a lot of uh, data so far. But it's kind of might be hard to see how we can actually use this to make decisions, and, and especially if we're trying to apply this to a game or something. So we're going to do kind of a weird thing here, and we're going to build a neural network by hand. Um, we're going to set all the weights, which is really atypical by hand. But we're going to do so in order to solve uh, or kind of navigate a maze. Um, and we're going to use very simple logic for our maze navigation. Basically what we see here. If you can go left, turn left. If you can't go left, but you can go forward, go forward. Otherwise, if you can't go left and you can't go forward, then we want to turn right. So we're basically just following the left-hand wall of our maze. Now, to make our lives uh, a little easier, we're going to make some, uh, we're going to do a couple things. First, our, uh, our movement is going to be controlled with what I like to call tank controls. Basically, we're going to power our legs or treads independently. So we'll have a, our output will be one, one output for the left-hand side and one output for the right-hand side. If we power the right-hand side positively and the left-hand side negatively, we'll actually turn to the left, meaning if you move your right leg forward and your left leg backwards, you start turning to the left. And also to keep our lives simple, our weights will only accept three unique values, either one, positive one, for we care about that input, negative one, for we care about the opposite of that input, or zero, we don't care about that input. So um, first thing, we have to start with our input layer. Now, it's typically a, a good approach to neural networks is to just give them all the input um, you possibly could have that could possibly be of any use to making this decision. Whether you're sure it's useful or not, um, the neural network will, when we, when we actually use a training algorithm, will figure out for you whether that, that input was useful to making the decision or not. Uh, to make our lives a little simpler, I'm going to remove some of our input possible inputs because we know they don't matter. Um, from our logic on the previous slide, we only care about can we go left or can we go forward. So we'll get rid of the other inputs. And our outputs, as I said, will we'll drive either the left or right side of our, our person, either our legs or treads. Um, so if we power the left leg positively and the right leg negatively, we would turn to the right. If we power them both positively, we'll move forward. So now we have to start making neurons. Uh, this first neuron will be used to decide should we turn left. Um, so start making connections um, from our input and we'll definitely need to know can we go left. And if we're trying to decide should we go left, um, whether or not we can go left is probably fairly important. So we'll weight that with a positive one. We'll also connect the can go forward input to this uh, neuron, which is just asking, should we go left? But we probably hopefully remember from the logic, we don't really care. When we're making the decision, should we go left? We're not gonna care whether or not we can go forward. So that'll get a weight of zero. And next we might try to attach our output of this neuron to our uh, drive left and drive right legs. Um, but we'll see if this neuron says, yes, we should turn left, um, then it will actually power both legs forward, which will make the, the agent move forward instead of turning left. Uh, there's other ways to solve this, but we're just going to add another layer of neurons. And, and this will allow us to weight uh, what those legs do individually. So instead of connecting our should turn left directly to the uh, output, we'll connect them to our layer one neurons. And now for the layer one neuron that connects to the left leg, we can give it a negative value 
and the right leg a positive value. Now when the neuron should turn left, output's true, um, it will move the left leg backwards and the right leg forwards, turning our agent to the left. So great, we have the first part, the if we can go left, turn left. Next, we are going to need a neuron for deciding should we go forward. We're actually going to do this one backwards from what we just did. because makes our lives a little easier. Um, the output of this is, is kind of simple. If, if this thing is deciding should we go forward, if it returns true, we want to power both legs to move our agent forward. Great. But now we have to connect our input layer to it to decide should we go forward. So the can go forward input is probably really important for deciding should we go forward. So it gets a weight of positive one. But here's the thing, we, we don't want to go forward if we can go left. So we are going to connect the can go left input to this neuron, but we're going to weight it with negative one. So if we if can go left is true, or one, it'll be good times by negative one, um, and that'll cancel out the can go forward. So now if we can go left and we can go forward, the should go forward neuron will output zero and not do anything, basically. The last of our neurons is the one for deciding should we turn right. And again, we'll connect the outputs first. Um, it will power the left leg positively and the right leg negatively to make the thing turn right when it says, yes, we should turn right. As for inputs, we only want to turn right if we can't go left and if we can't go forward. So both of those inputs end up with a negative one weight. And now we have a simple neural network that based on the, the concept of can go left and can go forward, um, could power an agent to, to move around a, a maze as we saw to sort of follow the left hand wall. Now what we just did is very atypical. Um, you often would have to set up the, the neurons yourself in, in, in the layers and how, decide how many you want, um, but, but setting the weights by hand is, is very uncommon. Instead, we'll, we'll use a procedural technique to train the neural network. That's, that's, where it, that's how it learns, some sort of technique to adjust those weights um, to, to learn to do something. Um, before we start training, though, we have to set weights to something. Um, and very common, we, we initialize those weights to just random values. Um, certain techniques will require that we initialize them to random values um, as opposed to what might make sense uh, to initialize them all to zeros or something like that. There are, there are training techniques that won't work correctly if we initialize all our weights to zeros. Um, so very common to, to initialize to random. Um, one technique we're not going to go too, too deep into is what's called backpropagation. Now, one of the most common ways for training a, a neural network or, or any sort of algorithm like this is we basically we, we compare our, uh, our output to expected results. So, so I, I plug in some inputs that I know what I want the output to be, and then we see what the output of our network actually is. And then based on that difference, how sort of far off from the expected result is, um, we adjust the weights to get the right answer. Um, how we adjust the weights can be very difficult to figure out though, um, to sort of adjust them in the right direction. Uh, Backpropagation is a technique that can be used to tell us sort of which way to adjust each of those, uh, those input weights, those synapse values, um, in order to get uh, closer and closer um, outputs to what uh, our expected values are. Another option that might be a little more familiar to you um, are genetic algorithms. Um, if we remember genetic algorithms, uh, a solution is called a chromosome and the individual pieces of our solution, our chromosome, are called genes. Um, so for, for using a genetic algorithm on a neural network, all these weights, all these synapse weights, all these input weights, those make up our genes. Um, and we can you know, use that genetic algorithm to, to kind of find better genes, better values for our weights. Um, theoretically, we could also use genetic algorithms to, to adjust the topology of the neural network. 
um, you know, we, you know, sort of the, the modification step of, a, or excuse me, the mutation step of a genetic algorithm, we might use that to try adding um, more layers, more neurons, reducing layers, reducing neurons, um, to, to again see if we get a better fitness value by, by mutating our results that way as well. So, neural networks, some, some benefits and drawbacks. So, benefit side, you know, we can, like I kind of me mentioned, we, you know, theoretically, we can, a neural network can solve any problem. Uh, it's not going to mean it's going to be the best way to solve that problem. Um, but if our problem is, is very difficult, um, maybe we don't know a solution to it, we don't really understand exactly what, what, how to set up a discrete algorithm for that, um, neural networks can make a good case for that. We could still be able to solve that problem. Um, an example for that would be something like pattern detection, um, where neural networks are pretty much better than anything else we have at the moment. It's very hard to decide, like, like you know, if I have a picture of a stop sign, how do I prove that that's a picture of a stop sign and not something else? Um, a very difficult problem that neural networks can solve. Um, uh, neural networks don't require hand coding. If we're actually using one of these procedural training uh, schemes, then, then we just give it different inputs to train on to, to learn a new problem. Um, and they can be very flexible. As I said, we're just, we're just you know, applying new inputs and new expected results um, to solve different problems. So, so we don't really have to rebuild this thing every time. Um, and of course, as mentioned, we uh, output numerical values, not just true or false. So, so those things uh, that could, that can be very useful too. You know, it's sort of a probability of how how likely we think the correct answer is or not. And we can use that. So if it's you know certainly if it's you know very high probability, we can just assume that. But maybe we can handle those ones where it's where we're unsure, sort of uh, in different ways. And uh, while training of the network can be very very slow. Um, once the network's trained, just feeding input into it to get an output out to the other side um, is, is a rather fast uh, process. So, so it's not very, very uh, time-consuming um, to get an output of a neural network. The training, though, can be extremely time-consuming. And on the drawback side, you know, as, as mentioned, it can be inefficient at many tasks. So you know, conceivably, we could use neural networks for path planning. But I pretty much guarantee you're not going to get a better result than something like A star um, in those cases. So you know, while while we can use it for any problem, it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be the best uh, the best solution for a given problem. Um, we also it, it, we're not we can't guarantee optimality with neural networks. Um, so we, so we might not always find the best solution or or even a good solution in some cases. Um, the, this, this idea here of a local minima is kind of beyond the scope of what we're trying to get into too much here, but that has to do with that, that idea I mentioned with backpropagation, where we're sort of comparing um, our, our output to expected outputs. And uh, if we were to sort of graph um, what all the outputs would be with different weights, we would find that that's usually not a um, it's not usually not a convex graph. It kind of has these little bumps and things, and it's it's possible to kind of get stuck in these spots. That's what the local minima is, where where mild adjustments in either direction actually make the answer worse, um, so that it gets stuck and and, and it doesn't even try um, bigger changes that would have actually made the the result better. Um, in general, the, the neural networks can be challenging to implement, debug, and control. That kind of kind of get this term of black boxes very often. So it's very hard to see exactly what's going on inside, um, especially during training. Is is is, the, is it getting better? Do we keep training? Do we keep training, or or are we just wasting time because we have an error or something in our in our system? Um, and as, as I kind of alluded to already, training can be very time intensive. You know, this is going to depend on on how large our network is and um, how many different points of input we need um, to solve our certain problem and how much data we have to use in order to train our thing. But that that process of training it to get the weights correct for the output you want um, can be very time intensive. Um, this is usually not something the end user should see the training step. In most cases, we're, we're going to actually just give them the results and that training happens you know, be behind the scenes somewhere. 
Um, and getting data for training can be very difficult and time consuming. Um, you know, kind of alluded to this idea already that you know, for training we often want data um, that we can pair with expected answers. Um, getting data is, is usually a little easier if we don't need those expected answers. You know, think you know, maybe we want a neural network that's that can uh, classify pictures. It can tell you uh, given given a pic, uh, some some picture it could tell you is this a dog, a human, or a flower. Um, to train that, we could definitely find lots and lots of pictures um, to train on, but we would have to have labels for each of those. We'd have to already know that this is a picture of a dog, this is a picture of a flower, this is a picture of whatever. Um, and that can be very hard to, to get and, and build up. Um, so neural networks are not used in video games a whole lot. Um, there, there are some cases like the Forza series, the Democracy series, the Supreme Commander 2 um, that, that have historically used neural networks um, for some very interesting use cases. You can go check those out if you're, you're interested. Um, but there, there's been some issues of things for, for what we often want in, in games. You know, there, we're not really, the neural network doesn't give us a whole lot of it deep control exactly what's going to happen. Um, this is more of a, on a design side, like if, if your designer wants very specific things to happen in a given time, the neural network's not necessarily going to give them those, those outputs. Um, and, and for the other drawbacks we mentioned. Um, that being said, we're, we're, neural networks are, are a very hot topic these days. There's a lot of growth in, in, that, in that realm. Um, and also we, as our computers get uh, more powerful, have more memory, and be a faster and parallel processing, um, we'll be able to do things with neural networks a little easier, and that might make, uh, make it more possible to use them in games more commonly. Thanks for listening. Have a good day.